Hello and welcome to worship at the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. My name is Vicar Elizabeth and I am so glad that you are worshiping with us today from wherever you are. While this pandemic has brought about many changes and horrible things and disrupted our normal lives, one of the blessings has been the opportunity to work on our own faith formation in our homes. And so I challenge you this week to delve into the scripture that we have today, to really think about where the Holy Spirit is acting and how the gospel of Jesus Christ is working in your life this week. And with that, I invite us to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope. For hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is taken from 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning with the fifth verse. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches 
or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. Here ends the first lesson. The psalm is uh, 119, and we'll read it by verse. Your decrees are wonderful, therefore I obey them with all my heart. When your word is opened, it gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as you always do to those who love your name. Order my footsteps in your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Rescue me from those who oppress me, and I will keep your commandments. Let your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your teaching. The second lesson for today is taken from Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 26th verse. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he, whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, Who's against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, with, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. 
So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. Kaleidoscopes. I remember these toys from my childhood. Do you? It was fun to hold one and look into the light, to delight in the beautiful colors and shapes and patterns. With just a little twist or a turn, I would see something entirely new, something I had never seen before. Today, Matthew offers us a kaleidoscope in his grouping of five parables of God's kingdom. He fires them off in rapid succession, and each one gives a new twist or a turn. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, like yeast, like a treasure hidden in a field, like a pearl of great value, like a fishnet let down into the sea. Taking things from ordinary, everyday life, Jesus offers five new glimpses into the holy, he engages our imaginations and he invites us to probe the mystery of the reign of God. We wonder what it will look like, how we might look for it, where we might look for it, and even whether we should look for it at all. The parables invite us to ponder what the shapes and patterns of God's kingdom will be or already are. They call us to examine our role and responsibility in the kingdom and in the spread of the kingdom. Each parable sheds a little more light on something we can't completely describe, something we can't fully know. For the past two weeks, Jesus has been teaching in parables. He has taken the stuff of the people's everyday lives. Farmers sowing seeds and weeds growing up alongside the wheat to tell them about the reign of God. The disciples have seemed puzzled by this teaching method. And so for these first two parables, Jesus has offered them an explanation. But in the portion of the passage that we skipped over, Jesus tells the crowds that in order to fulfill scripture, he will only teach in parables, that he will proclaim that which has been hidden from the foundation of the world. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, the smallest of seeds that grows into the greatest of shrubs, large enough that birds can find shelter in its branches. The kingdom of God is like yeast that the homemaker mixed with three measures of flour and all of it was leavened. The mustard seed and the yeast paired together seem to suggest both the hiddenness and the invasiveness of God's kingdom. Both start out incredibly small, but both begin their growth in such a way that we can't see it at first. The mustard seed is indeed very small and it does grow into a bush just not a bush large enough that we might mistake it for a tree. The mustard seed is so small, it is a symbol for our faith that also begins very small and yet can grow and expand in incredible ways. The small amount of leaven that the woman added to her bread dough was enough to leaven the entire batch. Now I have to pause here for a moment because this particular parable is fascinating. And it's fascinating because leaven was almost universally seen in early Judaism and in early Christianity as a symbol of something unclean. So why would Jesus use leaven here? 
something believed to be unclean, how can the dominion of God be like something unclean that is hidden in the midst of something else that is large, something that is holy? Jesus is talking about his unclean kingdom message, his message that is embraced by the marginalized, the outcast, those who were seen as unclean. People would hear this parable of leaven being equated to the kingdom of God and be shocked, be appalled as to why Jesus would compare something so holy to something so unclean. The leaven would take over, it would mold and shape and transform the dough. Today, we have domesticated this word leaven and we use yeast. So why should we be shocked about the kingdom of God being compared to yeast? Because it is invasive. Just a small amount of yeast can transform what you are making. Too hot and it's ruined. Too cold and it's ruined. But just the right temperature and you've proofed it. It expands and it grows and it becomes delicious bread as we know it. And yeast combined with flour, combined with water, is a mixing of good bacteria and bad bacteria that grow together in a process of transformation. Baking bread is messy, it's sticky, and it takes time, just like the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. The gospel of Jesus Christ began with humble beginnings, and yet, it has stretched far and wide across our globe. Something tiny, yet it is invasive, it is transformative. Several medieval Christian commoners suggested that the woman who is baking bread is an allusion to wisdom. That Jesus is fulfilling the role of wisdom, working his unclean message into society and being optimistic about the final eschatological outcome. Kneading it, working it, letting it sit out to grow and then gently tending to it throughout the day until it is ready. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, will keep kneading and tending to us so that the fullness of the kingdom of God can be realized on this earth. Once you put the yeast into the flour, you cannot take it out. Once God's kingdom begins to take root within us, we cannot take it out. We cannot separate. We cannot stop its work on us. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of a fine pearl or finding treasure. The hidden treasure and the pearl of great price are a pair of parables about finding something of great value, about buying and selling. Both speak of giving up everything for the one prize. Like the pearl, like the pearl merchant who sold everything she had, it cost this man everything he had to buy that field. Was it worth it? As it turns out, it was. And so I'd like to give the kaleidoscope a few more turns on this parable of the pearl of great price. I wonder what those pearls are in our lives. What in your life was so valuable that you would be willing to give up everything you have in order to keep it? For some, it might be going back to work. For others, it would be finally getting back to normal or bringing back someone who recently died and you would give anything to have them back. For others, it might be a home you've spent your fortune obtaining and your lifetime fixing up. Those answers are all tempting, but for me, if I was honest, it would be my family. If Jesus did offer us an explanation of this parable, I don't think these choices would be his answer. The pearl of great value is our relationship with God. A 
Are we willing to let go of everything we have and put that first? Like the treasure buried in the field, we have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. It is a pure gift. Will we value it for all it's worth, above and before all else? This is a tall order. Jesus doesn't explain to us what exactly is the treasure or the pearls within this parable. It's one of the beauties of the parables. They aren't spelled out for us. They invite our continued pondering. They are to evoke an element of God's inbreaking reign and reality into our lives. This work that happens to us can be a scary thing. It can be a hurtful thing. It can challenge. It can disrupt. Growth can be painful because the gospel of Jesus Christ, like a mustard seed and like leaven, invades into our very core, forming us and transforming us. Nobody said this would be, this way of life would be easy. But just like finding the pearl, it would be worth it. We can trust the growth of our faith to the God who loves us. The God who came to live among us and the God who gave up life for us. So keep your kaleidoscopes handy. Keep holding these parables up to the light. Keep turning them and twisting them in new directions. Listen for God's call in and through your discoveries. You are God's beloved. You have faith at least as big as a mustard seed. And with the power of God working in you, this is not only enough, it is an abundance. The kingdom of God is at work in you this very day. Amen. our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need. Merciful God, your reign is revealed to us in common things, a mustard shrub, the baking of bread, a fishing net. Help your church witness to the surprising yet common ways you encounter us in daily life. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. When your word is opened, it gives light and understanding. Increase our understanding and awe of your creation. Guide the work of scientists and researchers. Treasuring the earth, may we live as grateful and healing caretakers of our home. Hear us, O oh God. As the birds of the air nest in branches of trees, gather the nations of the world into the welcoming shade of your merciful reign. Direct leaders and nations to build trust with each other and walk in the way of peace. Hear us, O oh God. Your spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for the saints according to your will. Help us when we do not know how to pray. Give comfort to the dying, refuge to the weary, justice to those who are oppressed, and healing to the sick. 
especially those we name aloud or in our hearts. Hear us, O God. You show steadfast love and direct us to ask of you what we need. Help this congregation ask boldly for what is most needed. Refresh us with new dreams and being your people in this place and time. Hear us, O God. In you, our lives are never lost. Strengthen us by the inspiring witness of your people in all times and places. Embolden our witness now, and one day gather us with all your saints in the light. Hear us, O God. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Let us now pray in the words that our Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This blessing. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. 
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.